All right. Good morning, folks. Right. It's, uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, my name's Dave Newell at FBIA in Tallahassee. You all are safe and sound, uh, working remotely, or uh, maybe some of you are, are still going back and forth to the office a little bit. But uh, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, it's April 3rd. And uh, we have a hot topic, uh, website accessibility, compliance, and impending and threatened litigation. This has certainly been a hot button, and uh, we'll bring in Laura Pierce, our general counsel, in a minute, along with a Westport defense lawyer, um, to talk about this, of why and how agents' uh, websites are being targeted right now. Uh, we'll go into that. But uh, first order of business... Um, is to go ahead and stand up and stretch. It's your 10 o'clock stretch break. So, uh, Laura, I'm looking at you. I want to see you stretch. So, just kidding. But, uh, yeah, okay. go ahead and stretch while you're doing that. You know, uh, we received a lot of questions this week, uh, especially in Florida. We now have a, uh, a, a statewide order about uh, staying in place. So, uh, but I got a lot of questions from agents this week, Laura, asking me about, is their office still open to clients? I know some are going into the office agent-wise and still checking on things, but are, are the doors open for clients to actually come in? Um, so I'm just curious on, uh, on that. Under the governor's order, uh, uh, insurance agencies and companies are essential um, businesses. So you can keep your office open if you choose to. Uh, you can certainly choose to work remotely as well. So it's, it's your choice as an agency. So, so folks on the call, if, if your office is still open, are you allowing the public, public to come in? And I know a lot of agencies have sent notices out that they're not allowing the public to come in. If you want to make a payment, you can certainly slide it under the door. They'll, they'll transact that business and send you a receipt. Uh, but most agencies um, are not allowing the public. Um, this is a curious one that came in. How, how are those that have young children at home dealing with workflows? How are you guys handling that? Just pop that in there. We'll go through these pretty quick. And then, you know, how do you define a productive day? I know we're all working remotely. We're all, our routines are certainly now being stressed a little bit as this thing continues on. Uh, but kind of curious how you define a productive day. And then, Laura, uh, you know, we all like to have fun. Is it still okay to have some fun, you know, going through all this? And, I, you know, we suggest that you do. We suggest that you certainly uh, spend a little time uh, being outdoors and having a little fun uh, while you work and, and um, you know, sending uh, some jokes every now and again. We, we got several of them here recently at FAI and, you know, kind of just breaks, the, breaks you up a little bit and, and helps you out throughout the day. So. Just a reminder, uh, we have a dedicated uh, site on our website, a, uh, a tab that talks all about the coronavirus and all the breaking news, both in Florida and outside of Florida from a national basis. So certainly um, look at that at least, at least once a day uh, or at least um, three or four times a week. So to get the updates on that. And then the community. Um, Many of you are on the community. We see the uptick in people uh, looking at uh, the articles and the blogs that we're filing. So certainly suggest that, um, going that at least daily um, to look at the blogs and, and get the latest information of what's going on, especially in Florida on a lot of the coronavirus issues affecting insurance agents. And then we just want to remind you, you know, since you're, you know, kind of locked in right now, we have a variety of webinars and webcasts um, to offer you. Um, so certainly uh, go on the education site and take a look at those and uh, let's uh, schedule them. So are insurance agents considered essential service providers? Laura, I think that got answered this week, did it not? Yes, uh, it definitely under the governor's order. He references the federal guidelines um, that Florida should follow those federal guidelines. And in those guidelines, insurance agencies and companies are essential businesses. So that answers that. And certainly uh, we got this question a lot this week, uh, Laura, as well. How do I prove it? If I get stopped by authorities, how do I prove it? For some that have been licensed uh, a few years, you know, you, you probably have your ID card, your licensed ID card. 
Uh, for those that don't, we just suggest that you put something on the letterhead, have the agency principal sign it, and then carry that with you just in case. So uh, that came up. Uh, cancellations, non-renewals, and premium payments. Um, this has been blogged about. This has been talked about. This has been bannered about throughout the country. Uh, Florida is now uh, being asked to weigh in. Uh, FAIA is now in the process. We've done surplus lines, and I think we're going to do uh, another letter, Laura. I think it's under consideration, sending it to the OIR, asking for consideration on cancellation, non-renewals, and premium payments. For some that are following this, the NFIP has extended that grace period from 30 to 120 days. Just yesterday, the um, CFO came out with a statement uh, where Citizens is now uh, putting a 45-day moratorium on payments and cancellations. So people are starting to weigh in. I know some carriers are estab establishing their own guidelines, uh, but now we're we're asking FAI is asking more so on a on a on a uh, global basis uh, of what they would consider and and put in in place. So more on that. Um, uh, again, letters to the um, to the uh, CFO and the commissioner are being drafted to discuss this in more detail. Um, also, something that came up this week, uh, and I'm sure it's happening in other states. Uh, Becky can chime in on uh, if she writes me. But we learned um, that uh, Pearson View, who has the contract with the state of Florida to administer licensing exams uh, for the 220 the 2044 and the 215, those uh, uh, offices have been closed now for quite a while. Um, the goal was to have them reopen by mid-April, but now with the governor's order mandating uh, uh, further closures until the end of April, um, I don't think that's going to happen. So we've reached out to Pearson View, uh, asking them when they consider uh, reopening and give us potentially a timeline uh, but right now, those testing centers are closed, um, and unfortunately, we, we've gotten many emails from agents that are have staff in a position to sit for the state exam, and unfortunately, at this point, uh, can't do it. So just uh, keep that in mind and look for more information from us as, as we get it. Uh, business interruption debate. Um, we can uh, spend another uh, 12 hours on that, and we won't today, but... Um, any of you have seen articles that we've posted and then articles nationally about this debate. So Florida is not weighed in, uh, we'll see how that all uh, unfolds in the future, but certainly there's a lot of um, uh, issues that everybody's debating on coverage and uh, uh, applying uh, coverage and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind and we'll keep you up to date as far as we can. Uh, COVID-19 compensable under the State Workers' Compensation Act. Uh, our, uh, our good friend Frank Panaccio uh, uh, penned a blog this week and talked about it and had some uh, Q&A from NCCI about it. So certainly recommend taking a look at Frank's blog. Uh, Demotech downgrades. We already had a few people online ask about those. So just to uh, uh, further what's being said there on the screen, all Florida domestics carriers uh, were affirmed with an A uh, recently as Wednesday, the last one of the group that was uh, pending um, not being uh, affirmed. All those have been affirmed now by Demotech. So um, enough said on that. Um, and then the last thing, uh, Laura has blogged on these things quite a bit, and we'll talk about those in the next few weeks. Uh, but Talk about the, uh, you know, the different things that are out there and available for uh, small business, uh, certainly independent agents uh, fit in that category. Um, so follow Laura's blogs because there's a lot of good information that she could uh, help you with or, or really point you in the right direction on all these things through the stimulus bill and other uh, paycheck protection programs. I know there was another new thing that came out yesterday, Laura. Uh, so. You know, I just recommend, again, just following the blogs, trying to uh, piece this stuff together. And certainly, if you have any questions, reach out to any of us here at FAI. We'll be glad to help. So there's Laura Pierce. Uh, welcome again, Laura. Um, and then also on the line for this uh, beginning of discussion is Ben Andrews. Welcome, Ben. Hey, Dave. So, so folks, um, 
let's just kind of lay the and, and they'll do the background. But you know, this this started uh, several a uh, month or two ago now, Laura, where we started to receive some some inquiries from our members about all this. So kind of just uh, you and Ben just lay down the background of this and help our members better understand this issue. Sure. Um, I'll start and then maybe Ben, ben can chime in on some of these, these legal strategies and arguments since he knows way more about that than I do. Um, but uh, if you've seen any of my blogs that I've posted probably over the last couple of years, this ADA website compliance issue is nothing new. Um, lots of businesses and various industries have been targeted. Um, the big eye has a lot of information on their website about it, and um, you can find a link to that on any of my blogs. But it appears that uh, recently, in Florida anyway, and maybe in other states, if we can hear from some of the folks on the line from, from other states, but uh, in Florida, certainly, insurance agencies are now being targeted. Um, we're aware of probably, I say 20 here, they're probably upwards of 30 now that I've heard about. So there are probably many more that have been targeted by a certain law firm. Um, and uh, usually those um, demand letters and claims come in by email with attachments. But um, the ones that we have seen have come from an attorney. Um, her name's referenced here on the next slide. Um, uh, Jennifer Espinette Portel of the Portel Law Group or a related firm, or they, you know, there are various paralegals that, that send those notices to agents. And the, her client or the plaintiff is a woman named Natalie Reyes. In the complaint, the draft complaint itself and in the demand letter, you know, it says she's a visually impaired person who's an activist and a tester for online accessibility for the blind or visually disabled people. So the, the demand letter um, typically states that the plaintiff, while attempting to navigate an agency's website, um, even using screen reading software, uh, has encountered multiple access barriers and, and basically says, you know, that she's denied full and equal access to the information contained on the website with regard to residential real estate transaction and homeowners insurance. And we'll we'll hear a little bit more from Ben about how that kind of fits together because they're making they're making allegations under the, the Fair Housing Act. Um, so that's kind of what how they're tying this together. Um, but the, the complaint, the draft complaint, it's, it hasn't been filed that I'm aware of against any of these agencies, but it's a draft. You know, it alleges that um, because the agency's website is not accessible to persons with disabilities, it's not in compliance with website guidelines. Um, we've got a, a guest that's going to um, be speaking with us later in, um, in the webinar today about those website accessibility guidelines. But the draft complaint just basically alleges that because of that, the website violates both the state and federal Fair Housing Act. And it's important to know that um, the demand letter that comes with the, um, the email and the draft complaint says that even if the agency re resolves this matter without litigation, I mean, if you address it and go ahead and fix your website, um, they're going to send a conditional release. So they will release you a further, um, you know, litigation claims, provided you um, pay their attorney's fees. Now, we haven't seen any of those, um, the, the next step, we haven't seen those additional demand letters as of yet, um, but it looks like they're coming. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to Ben now and talk more about, you know, some of the details of this case and, and you know, some of the legal strategies and arguments. Okay, thanks, Laura. Uh, again, my name is Ben Andrews, and I'm an attorney in Tallahassee. Uh, I have been uh, practicing civil litigation for uh, coming on 32 years, and um, most of what I've done uh, historically has been uh, professional liability defense, particularly defense of agents in errors and emissions claims uh, and other professionals. Um, but my firm and, and I have done uh, some of this uh, uh, ADA website or generalized ADA compliance um, litigation in the past. Um, and, and so let's talk first about some of the differences or, or how these claims are coming up. Um, all of you have probably heard just in general about uh, ADA compliance lawsuits. Um, and sometimes they're as simple as a physical 
uh, limitations to a to a business to access to a business. Uh, for instance, you know, not a not a appropriate wheelchair ramp, um, things of that nature. Um, so the you know the the question now is how does this apply to websites? Does it apply to websites? The interesting part here is that while uh, in other industries, some of these claims um, have been uh, brought under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. These proposed claims, and again, as Laura said, the, what, the, what we have seen, and, and um, uh, my firm's involved in at least um, you know, representation of six different uh, agencies right now, um, and what we have seen is that, that an agency will receive a, a, a letter a demand letter, um, and then attached to that will be a proposed or a sample complaint that they intend to file in federal district court in whichever jurisdiction uh, you may be, the Southern District, the Middle District, or the Northern District. Um, and, those, and those complaints or those claims then um, uh, reference specifically the, Fair House, the federal Fair Housing Act um, and the Florida Fair Housing Act. Now, they do not specifically reference the ADA. And the reason is um, that what they're trying to do is trying to say that under the Fair Housing Act, um, you'll see in, in this particular slide that there's a reference to that it shall be unlawful to discriminate against any person in the terms, conditions, or privileges of sale or rental of a dwelling or in the provision of services or facilities in connection with such dwelling because of a handicap. So the argument we think that they will make is that first off, providing or making available homeowners insurance is a provision of services in connection with um, a dwelling, a rental or sale of a dwelling. And then secondly, that because of um, improprieties, if you will, in the website, that a person, a disabled person, particularly um, in this circumstance, a blind or visually impaired person, is unable, at, it is disproportionately, and that's the key, disproportionately unable uh, to obtain those services that a non-disabled person is trying to obtain through the website. Um, there's all kind of issues, legal issues that arise as to the application of either the federal or the Florida statute in this circumstance. Um, and and in, in, at least in Florida, the Florida Fair Housing Act is identical to the federal Fair Housing Act. So for all intents and purposes, you know, that the actions just, it, it, it just allows both a federal and a, a Florida claim. Um, but um, but the, the, uh, the issues, that that we think are going to be particular to agencies is is an insurance agency just because they procure or make available for sale uh, homeowners insurance or rental insurance is that sufficient to implicate the uh, provision of services section of this statute we think that's going to be an issue and we also think the issue of simply because your website uh, may have a create a difficulty for a visually impaired person. Does that mean that you are discriminating against them or limiting their access? When in actuality, there will be other steps. I mean, we all know that you know that that looking on a website is usually just the first step in in seeking or trying to obtain that insurance. And typically, there's going to be a lot of other things that occur, namely getting information speaking to the potential insured, completing an application, um, and, and then communicating about the application, binding the coverage, and issuing the policy. Uh, some of which obviously is done by, uh, by the carrier or the broker, um, and some of which the agent enables or assists in. Um, but all of those factually create a lot of issues as to whether this act applies, how it applies to this particular person, is this person truly uh, you know, trying to get those services. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. Is it, we, we know, I mean, they've been upfront about the fact that this is a, uh, this is a tester is what they and, um, reference this person as. And is a tester 
you know, th this person really has no, if this person is sending out requests through throughout the state from Pensacola to Key West, uh, is this is this person even intending to get the those services, the provision of those services? The a answer is no, but courts have said that doesn't necessarily matter for uh, ADA purposes, and we think that'll be the same answer with respect to an FHA claim like this. So there, there are some issues in, in that respect uh, as to what we typically call standing and whether or not this person uh, would have standing to make a, a claim. Um, actual injury is not necessarily required. Um, uh, it, it's not necessary that they, as we said, that they live in the area or that they specifically intend uh, to, to purchase that insurance. Um, the, the fundamental question is, um, you know, the, the elements of, of a disparate impact claim in a, in a, in a case like this are whether the, the, occurrence, uh, the occurrence of certain outwardly neutral practices and a significantly adverse or disproportionate impact on persons of a particular type produced by the defendant's facially neutral acts or practices. And again, here, demonstration of discriminatory intent uh, is not required under a disparate impact theory. And so in this circumstance, this is what we think that they're, they're likely to argue is that this is an outwardly neutral practice, but it's having a significant disproportionate impact on, uh, in this case, visually impaired persons. Um, so some of the defenses that we think will, will be raised or, or may be applicable and again, let me just say, I mean, as a caveat here, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm involved in some of these claims, but while the, the, the law as to the applicability of the FHA or the Florida FHA to insurance agencies is a more generalized question, um, each, each uh, agency's website is, you know, the, 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 the issues that they are raising as to website compliance is different for every agency. You know, some have a, a problem with the web reader. The web reader can't necessarily navigate or, or can't read the text um, as it's uh, typically designed to do. And our, and our, um, our tech uh, IT expert will speak to that more specifically. Um, but every one of them maybe have a different issue. Uh, but the fundamental question is, is that issue uh, having a disproportionate impact on visually impaired persons? Um, so when we talk about defenses, we, you know, the question is, is there any disparate impact um, on, on persons of, that are visually impaired? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the errors, uh, at least under the ADA, they must allege the er errors um, with the website cause an inability to access the pertinent parts of the website. For instance, we're talking here about homeowner's insurance. The fact that your uh, pop-up or your portion, your tab related to automobile insurance um, or, uh, you know, CGL or something like that may be, um, may be the problem. Well, that's not having anything to do with homeowner's insurance. So in this context, it's going to have to be something specific to the provision of homeowner's insurance or rental insurance. Um, and then the other thing that they seem to be saying is, and, and again, we'll get into some of the details on the, on the web accessibility guidelines, but trying to suggest that a certain guideline, the WCAG 2.0, is a guideline that everyone must comply with. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, if you do comply with that, then, then there's really no, no issue, but it's, it's not per se, uh, you know, a violation if you do not. Um, so then lastly, the, the issue as to, you know, where uh, we've talked about defenses and, and, um, uh, and then the last thing is are actual damages required? Well, that's, that's really where these cases are going. There, there are no actual damages, and, and I, I dare say, you know, no one can establish any actual damages. But under the ADA and, and also under the FHA, actual damages are not necessarily required. Um, discriminatory action alone may be sufficient to support a, I mean, to, to be a prevailing party under the statute, which would support an award of attorney's fees. And unfortunately, that's the driver in these cases. 
and and that's where um, you know that's that's where this little cottage industries come from. Um, so you know my recommendation, and again this I you know I I I'm careful not to give legal advice. My first recommendation is you know you're you're being threatened with a lawsuit, and they're sending you a copy of the lawsuit if you receive one of these. Um, I I would recommend you talk to a lawyer uh, that that can help you navigate what's the best way to go forward. Um, but you know, one of the things I think is pretty easy to do is to find out very quickly what the issue is or may be with your website. And if there is an issue that can be fixed quickly uh, that enables these uh, readers to be able to operate properly, then fix it, um, get it fixed. But don't don't you know make an admission. Don't don't uh, you know respond back. Well, because of your letter, we fixed our website. You know. It is in your best interest to fix your website so anybody and everybody that wants to get on your website can get on it and can you know potentially buy uh, get get services from you. So it's in your best interest to fix it, get it fixed, and uh, you know get in touch with your IT provider to get to get help. Um, you know the question of whether you're doing it strictly because of this notification or not that may end up being an issue. So I'm very careful to to uh, the response to this letter and to the demand, and I can tell you that you will likely get phone calls from someone from that office saying, we want to talk to you about how you can come in compliance. Um, I would not uh, engage in discussions with them. I would not uh, try to talk to them about any of that. Uh, if you just fix your website and, and, um, uh, and then you know, talk to your attorney about whether or not that's enough for you right now or whether you should take some other proactive action. Um, Laura, I've talked too long. You gave me an open stage and didn't give me a, a red <laughs> light, so I'm going to stop now. No, yeah, that's great. I, I would just say one one other thing. I know some of you have probably heard this because I blogged about it a while back, that there was um, a case last year um, in federal court in the Southern District of Florida where the judge actually sanctioned a serial ADA plaintiff and his attorney. Um, I don't know what you want to say about that, Ben. If you, you know, uh, uh, how likely that would happen in a case like this, or or not likely? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's a very interesting case, and and I think it's, you know, it's a it's an interesting read. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a it's a it's an indictment against uh, some of this little cottage industry, and I'm not saying that that's going on in with respect to this group that's that's now making the threats against insurance agencies. But that case was somewhat unique in the in the in the sense that there was evidence before the court that um, this uh, ser serial uh, activist and serial lawyer that filed I don't remember how many hundreds of these website I mean it wasn't website first off it was not website compliance it had to do with another uh, compliance issue but uh, what the court you know said was or found that there was some out and out fraud between that lawyer and that um, that um, um, claimant, and then with their compliance department, if you will, um, and there were also bar violations with respect to fee shift. Excuse me, fee sharing, attorneys fee sharing, which is improper under the Florida bar rules. Um, so there were some uniquenesses to that as to why the court just hammered that lawyer and that claimant. Um, but there have there have been a number of cases where I think you know the one thing we're seeing is the federal courts are are not they, they don't have a lot of patience necessarily with what they see as um, opportune plaintiffs lawyers and plaintiffs trying to just take advantage of a a law that is you know intended for the purpose of trying to allow people that are visually or otherwise handicapped visually impaired or handicapped to get access. I mean, that's a, a noble goal, and we all ought to be in favor of that, but these people were just taking advantage of it crazily, um, and so that court just really slammed uh, that lawyer, but it does show a, a real um, uh, apprehension of the courts to just kind of go crazy with, with this stuff, and fortunately in Florida, uh, the 11th Circuit, which is our controlling circuit um, in the Southeast, is you know fairly conservative. But there are a number of these cases that are coming out of the California courts and the Cal California federal courts um, that, as you might imagine, kind of go um, kind of go crazy uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, findings against businesses for these compliance issues. 
Well, thanks, Ben. Um, and Laura and Ben, a uh, couple things, because some questions are coming in now, uh, talking about uh, potential coverage. And I know, Laura, the, uh, we got involved in this, and you guys were, uh, not Ben, but uh, FAI folks were on a call recently with uh, Westport in reference to some of this. So um, can you just kind of um, help us and help the members understand a little bit better about how their E&O policy would or would not apply to some uh, something like this? Uh, I can respond, I guess, and, and then you can chime in. But I, I have seen uh, some of our members filing a, um, a claim with uh, Westport, um, their you know provider, and um, those claims have been denied. You know, I hate to say don't file a claim, but I, um, in a general sense, I don't believe that you know coverage covers this. Um, nor does a cyber policy or a general liability policy. Would you agree, Ben? I mean, from my knowledge, uh, you certainly have. I have understood that uh, Westport, uh, with with respect to the Westport E and O policies, has taken the position that there is no coverage. I haven't gotten involved in in that question as to whether there's coverage under the E and O policy, um, but I, I don't know. You know, cyber policies um, uh, are kind of all over the place. Um, I would be certainly interested in in if if I had if my agency had a cyber policy I would certainly be exploring whether or not it would cover something like this um, but I but I think that uh, for those I mean I know everyone on the call that sells cyber knows that there there are there's no great standard for what a cyber policy provides or doesn't provide right and then and then lastly um, certainly EPLI has now come up so you know it's it's this is the kind of thing that is all over the board, and I don't think it's really been tested from a coverage uh, aspect yet, uh, other than, you know, Westport has made a decision as far as E&O. Uh, I don't think some of the other entities, like Ben said, on cyber and now EPLI and whether or not a general liability policy would apply as well. So I think, you know, it's still to be determined. Um, we'll, we'll certainly keep monitoring this and following up. But Laura, you know, one of the things we brought, uh, not only is uh, Ben a friend, uh, but Ben's also a lawyer with uh, uh, a firm that's our outside general counsel. And and we just thought having Ben on today, not only to talk about the issues because he's defending some of these folks, but also for those out there that may uh, find themselves in uh, need of legal advice on these issues, we thought what better person to bring and our, our friends from the Pennington firm and Ben to bring them on to talk about this thing. So we're not reinventing the wheel. If you if you give Ben a call, he's gonna he's gonna know the story. He's gonna know the issues. So we're not selling Ben. We're just letting you know we gotten a lot of calls about this, Laura, right? And look people are looking for for legal advice. And and our goal here today is if you need it, we certainly, you know, if you don't have your own counsel there locally, uh, certainly reach out to uh, Laura and, and myself or, or Ben directly, and certainly he can walk you through these issues. Right, Laura? That's right. Uh, I mean, I think the important point, and Ben even said it, is, you know, you really need to consult with an attorney on this. I don't think these these claims are going away. Um, yeah, a couple questions are coming in. Um, you know, uh, Ben, uh, one one agent saying our website can't be fixed. Um, should we just shut her down? What's your advice? Well, I think, um, you, you know, uh, why it can't be fixed. I mean, I, I, I don't know. You're, you're, you're taxing my knowledge about whether, how, how a website, um, you know, why it, and, and maybe it's just, maybe it's so old that there's no ability to run that type of software. Um, you know, uh, if I were, if if I had received one of these letters uh, and that were the case that the website could not enable a a reader software to to read the uh, to read the text, um, I, I would be considering possibly shutting it down or at least looking at you know is there maybe you can make it more uh, uh, more nondescript so that there's not 
um, there, there's not anything that someone who is visually impaired is is lose is disproportionately affected. I mean, that's the standard. Are they disproportionately affected in some way? Um, and you know, if if uh, if it's all going to turn into you have to call me anyway, then it may not matter. But these, you know, the problem with these web with these lawsuits are it is a technical if you I mean it's a technical violation. And it doesn't matter again whether or not somebody is is trying to really get insurance services. It is a gotcha type of case. And so, I mean, I would probably be looking seriously at at uh, shutting it down and revamping it very quickly to make it uh, figure out how to make it compliant. So, another question came in: Was the uh, WCAG 2.0 guidelines in effect in 2018? That's when this last ADA issues were brought into the limelight for us. Were they? Were they I'm not. I'm not sure the answer to that, Dave, but I think maybe um, Kyle can answer that. I don't know. Yeah, I can talk a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, there's level A compliance. There's level 2A compliance, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. And can send out the full list um, after, you know, Dave, if anyone reaches out to you, yeah. I have a full checklist that we kind of use internally. I'm just, I touched on a few points during my right. presentation today and then they can, we right. can use that. We're going to bring Kyle uh, in, in a minute. He's our uh, uh, website uh, expert, but Ben, thanks so much. Uh, we, you know, just tell everybody your, your email address if they want to get a hold of you to, to, uh, you know, certainly discuss this further, uh, Ben. Okay, sure. Um, Again, uh, uh, my name is Ben Andrews, and I'm with the Pennington Law Firm here in Tallahassee. My email address is B as in Ben Andrews, so Bandrews at Pennington, that's P-E-N-N-I-N-G-T-O-N-L-A-W, PenningtonLaw.com, B Andrews at PenningtonLaw.com. Happy to answer any questions and talk uh, to anybody that's interested as to what we have done and and there is you know an effort to try to to sort of um kind of gang up on this opposition and you know the the more firms uh, the more agencies that we have uh, all working together um you know in in common interest uh, will help to kind of uh, allow us to to uh, strike back pretty hard all right well thanks folks thanks ben uh certainly um um, a lot of information, follow Laura's blogs. Uh, we'll have a lot more on this. I know more and more agents are being contacted. I'm seeing them uh, uh, type in questions here about it. Um, anything we don't answer, folks, during uh, today's uh, webinar, we'll certainly get back to you offline uh, and, and respond to those questions. But, you know, let's go ahead and, and talk about web, website compliance and bring our friend Kyle Clement in uh, from uh, Clement Media and uh, talk about from his perspective, um, you know, Laura and Ben said it a few times and I'll say it, you know, Kyle is somebody that's uh, deep into the websites, uh, does a lot of this uh, compliance, uh, was referred to us by our uh, FMS partner, uh, Vine IT. Uh, many of you folks uh, deal with Vine IT and Nate and his group, uh, but Kyle's here today to to kind of walk us through some of this from a practical perspective, uh, right, Kyle? Correct, correct. And, and Ben gave me a perfect segue on you know, that. You know, you, you have two issues when this is happening, right? You have the legal issue, and then you have the web issue. And the legal issue, you need to address that first. You don't want to, you know, even though this can come across as like a shakedown or a, you know, unsure, uncharted waters, you definitely want to get with the, you know, your attorney first, get with Ben first, and, and just get that process going because you don't want to get you know, too far along or maybe make a fix and realize that you have a bigger issue than just a web fix. So that's that's way above my pay grade and you get much smarter people on this call that can help you with that. As far as the website side, you know, I'm going to show you guys, my goal today is just going to talk to you about what we do as a, you know, web development agency and marketing agency, just to make sure that we are, you know, building the site to the most recent compliance and just some of the the things that we're seeing and the sites that are most susceptible to being targeted. Um, and, and again, that's, what we've seen, it, it changes daily. I mean, this has been something that's been going on since, you know, at least 2008 was one of the big notable cases when Target, um, they had a $6 million settlement for ADA compliance and it was from the 
um, the accessibility, the National Federation of the Blind was targeting Target's website. Um, the, the crazy part about this that we saw from a you know web development is that the the National Federation of the Blind's website was not even ADA compliant when they were targeting you know Target. So it was you know, but there obviously there was a settlement, and there you know that's where it's an issue that's you know definitely we've seen it going from like industry to industry, and it is very apparent amongst you know insurance agencies' websites right now. And I think part of that is that one thing that we see that gets targeted a lot are sites that are like older or out of date. You know, we, it seems like now that if like a, whoever's, you know, targeting these sites, if they can go on there and look at it real quick and see that it doesn't comply because there's not high contrast elements, which we'll be talking about, or that it's, you know, one big thing is just the copyright date in the bottom of your website. If that's something that hasn't been updated. And, you know, sometimes you see those that are five, six, 10 years old at the very bottom of your site, which says the last time it was updated. So something as little as that could just make you an, an, an extra threat or, you know, make your website more susceptible um, to, you know, individuals that are out there trying to, you know, target these lawsuits. Um, the, the first slide I talked about, I mean, if you, the stat, you know, people with disabilities make up 26% of the population. So, I mean, it's, it's beneficial as I think Ben, Laura, and Dave all emphasize that you want to make sure your website's accessible because these are people that are using your website to potentially, you know, new customers. And so like that, that traffic, you want to make sure that you're, you know, putting your best foot forward, that you're getting information, because these are people that one could just be trying to get a policy, or they could be trying to get new information, and they could be trying to reach out to you. So the benefit right there, um, you know, makes a lot of sense for anyone who's trying to, you know, get their website up to date. And um, one thing I talk about at the end, um, just a, a common problem, though, is like, if, you know, a lot of times what we're seeing with accessibility and these lawsuits is sites that are not optimized. You've probably heard about search engine optimization a lot. And, you know, then maybe that's, a, that's another topic for another time. But what we see is websites that are really optimized correctly and websites that have really good SEO, um, those are sites that tend to follow a lot of the elements necessary, you know, in this, you know, WCAG 2.0 compliance and level, you know, AA compliance. And so, as I said earlier, um, one thing that we can do, we can say we have a much longer checklist than what um, I checked for. I put a few highlighted items items in the slide right here, but we have a much more detailed checklist. If you reach out to Dave, um, I'm happy to send that over and you can run that by your existing, you know, web department, or um, if you have an internal person, they can look at it. Um, I also provide a couple plugins that are, you know, things that you can install on Google Chrome. You can look at your website and it gives you like a few of the errors that, um, that could be causing you to be susceptible to these, to these lawsuits. So um, a couple things that I, you know, that we have seen a lot. I mean, every website is a little different. Um, a lot of times, you know, someone asks that my site's, you know, out of date. Um, we've seen that a lot of times the question is, do I fix it or do I just start with a new website? Um, that's kind of a case by case basis, but we're seeing a lot of times these older websites, these sites that haven't been updated in a long time, they're built on like custom, um, what we call content management systems, like a custom platform. Those are the sites that are that are tough because to fix those sites and to get them, you know, to the compliance level that we feel comfortable putting out on the web, it's almost going to cost you as much to just build a new site. And as someone else mentioned on this call, that gives you an opportunity to build a site that is more call driven. Like, yes, you want to have as much information as possible, but you know, if you're, if you're driving people to make a phone call and you're giving, you know, we've seen in a lot of our compliance scans and as we even do reviews with, um, you know, outside agencies that are reviewing the insurance agency's website, like a lot of times as, as you put less definite information on the site and then drive them to contact you and call you, you know, you're going to protect yourself a little bit on that end too. So I'm going to run through this list kind of, you know, quickly, but, you know, alt text images is a big one. That's an SEO, um, you know, best practice, and it's also an accessibility um, best practice. And so that's just adding the right, you know, again, the idea is that someone can use a screen reader, they can use their software. And in that first slide, I talked about the different impairments that you're trying to check off, you know, to be able to compliant for. And so we really want to make sure the alt text images are, you know, labeled correctly and that you have that, you know, on the back end of your site. Um, that's, again, relatively low hanging fruit. Um, navigation elements. Um, if you have like images that are, like some people back in the, the day used to put like images to make like a really, you know, pretty menu on their website. And that, you know, it looked really nice, but it didn't, you know, function very well. So a lot of times the form fit and function test applies really well in the, you know, compliance test. So 
making sure that your navigation elements don't have any empty links, that you're not, instead of saying like, view all resources, you need to say like, view homeowners insurance resources, view commercial insurance resources. Don't just have like a view all generic link on there, because that's gonna be something that's gonna make it difficult to navigate on the website. And what, and what we use whenever we're trying to explain navigation is kind of think if you were trying to read a newspaper that you'd be able to get through to the certain page. You know, if you wanted to get to the, you know, the business section, the local business section, it's very detailed out. I mean, you want your web navigation to look the same way. You don't want it to just have like a view all because then they're going to get stuck on this page and there's going to be no way for them to navigate to the, to what they're trying to find. So um, the other thing is being able to ability to navigate the pages with the keyboard only. So that's like them being able to read the navigation of the site, and then that kind of goes into that view all piece of it too, is that you're able to you know, dive into the page accordingly. Um, text is appropriate size and readable. Um, this is you know, very similar to one of the later points about the high, oh, I skipped, sorry, sorry, high contrast elements. We talked about that earlier. Um, that's, that's really one of the most crucial things. If you come to a site that is, um, you know, white on light blue, or doesn't have that high contrast where the text is easy to read, or it's like a, you know, gray text on a white background and it gets lost. I mean, that's one of the things that we've seen is like the immediate um, red flags. And, and on a lot of these checking um, plugins and just like the, the um, compliance scan that we do, that's one of the first ones that we look at. Because you can open up a site and, you know, if you guys have, you're welcome to send sites to me, I can find out pretty quickly if you think it's in question. I mean, the high contrast is one of the big big red flags and what we call like low hanging fruit of something that you should get fixed. Um, we've had companies that have like a specific color, like a, like orange is a tough color um, to read on these scanners, but their logo is orange and they're, that's their company corporate color and they don't want to change it. So that's something where you'd have to consult with, you know, legal professionals, see how that works because that's a tough one. You know, if you're not willing to compromise there on your branding, I mean, that's one that we have seen become a, a relative frequent, frequent issue. Um, the text, that one is, you know, kind of self-explanatory. Um, the thing that people miss with this, though, is that you need to make sure that it's appropriately sized on your website, but also your mobile device. Um, a lot of times these responsive websites are, you know, and this is designed to be on like a computer, but you just got to make sure that as you're building it responsive, and, you know, nowadays a lot of people are building it for mobile first. Well, you still have to make sure that your mobile first, your mobile optimized website still looks good on the desktop reader because that's where a lot of this is going to, uh, you know, take place. Um, the last one before we get into the plugins is uh, make sure the JavaScript features. JavaScript is like Flash or um, some of the dynamic elements that are make your site look really um, professional and make it look very interactive and uh, very high end at times. But you have to make sure that your you know, that they have fallbacks in case they turn JavaScript off. That's like, a, again, that would be one for your web developer, your web agency, um, your tech, to, to send that over to them and, uh, and make sure that you're uh, doing that correctly. So, again, those are a few of the big ones that I think are easy to, like, understand, highlight out. Again, we have a full list um, of over, you know, several, you know, it's like two pages of checklist items, and we're happy to send that and share that with you guys. And, uh, you're welcome to um, use that. Uh, we're using that Wave plugin. That's the um, hold on. I was forget. It's the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. So that's something that if you have Google Chrome as your browser, or if you download Google Chrome, you can install that plugin. And I, um, I include a screenshot down there where we just pull up the FAI site and it shows you a couple like where there's errors and what things that are like that you need to address. I mean, a lot of sites have this, and so. Um, it is important that even if you're having a web developer build your site, that you're, you know, letting them know that it's not a standard. It's not as standard as you would hope for a web development agency just to include ADA compliance. I mean, that's something that does take, you know, someone who's been through, you know, that has taken one of these courses, has kind of been through the the gamut a little bit, and has, uh, you know, run with this. So that is something I would, you know, encourage you to to take a look at, get that plugin, look at your own site, and it'll let you know if there's any like, you know, critical errors on your site. Um, the other thing we talked about making sure that you, you know, if you have an older site, that's when you want to really double check and then making sure that you're following, just like doing a decent job on SEO, that search engine optimization. That's like where you're, because because at the end of the day, Google is a reader. The, the Google reads your page and they're trying to make sure that your site is accessible for everyone else to find across the web. So if you're building your site to Google, 
um, standards, like best practices, a lot of times you're going to be building it to um, the you know, WC, sorry, I call it W3C, that's the older version of compliance. And so it's uh, W3.org. And then uh, they have their, you know, accessibility guidelines at WCAG, you know, 2.0, and they have their supporting documents on that, on that site. So the last thing that um, I would really encourage you to, to talk to with an attorney and get like a statement, but what we've started to do on a lot of our websites is that we're putting a accessibility policy on the bottom. So um, you've seen a lot of times, a lot of companies right now are putting um, like advertising policies, privacy policies on there, um, you know, because they're using the, the user's information to retarget them across the web and advertise to them. So that was a big, you know, started with the European Union and, you know, really started to affect websites in the, in the United States recently is that you have that privacy policy that you let people know that you're using their information. Well, we've just added, and I, I showed you one of what the National Federation of the Blind has done since, but they've put an accessibility policy on their website. And so they, you know, get the language approved by your attorney um, and what, what they're saying on their side is, hey, we're committed to ensuring that our communications, including our website, are accessible to people with disabilities. We seek to ensure that all pages on our website are designed for that W3C, that's Web Content Disability, and the WCAG 2.0 level AA conformance. So we review our website periodically to check and improve accessibility. And you know, we have favored third-party web content and technology providers. So like, we're doing everything we can do. But if you face any barriers on your website and, and or other federal, you know, Federation communication channels, please do not hesitate to let us know. So it's like, again, get that approved, get that language approved by your attorney, but having that, you know, policy on your website, it's it's kind of a, you know, CYA type type policy where you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can. Reach out to me first before you try to, um, you know, get a law student. And I can't say this is going to work 100% of the time, but I definitely think for relatively low effort, it's a great, you know, insurance policy to have on your website. You know, Kyle thank you. Got a lot of questions coming in, and we'll certainly answer those. And certainly, uh, people are interested on your services. So, just on the screen, this is uh, Kyle's company. Uh, how long he's been around? Certainly, some of the things that he does, and uh, from a web a website uh, um, position. So, uh, I'll try to answer these as many as we can, and we will. As Kyle said, uh, he will. Um, provide that checklist to us. I'll get it out to everybody that attended uh, today's uh, session, along with Kyle's uh, contact information. And certainly uh, we recommend you reach out to Kyle and at least have a conversation. And who knows, um, you may want your website reviewed and, and certainly additional questions from that side of the equation. On the legal side, you know, Ben and Laura have already kind of discussed that. So, um, Thank you, Kyle, for that. We, we do appreciate it. Um, uh, there's certainly a lot of questions. I, I wish I could get to all of them, but I, I can't. Uh, we try to uh, limit every, this uh, session to an hour, so I want to make sure we do that um, today. So um, just a couple reminders. Uh, we're running a special to the 15th of April. Uh, used to be tax day, but now that's been extended, so got a little more time to pay your taxes or file your taxes. But uh, uh, we're running a special with Aben. Certainly uh, recommend you get on there and take advantage of that while you have a little more time on your hands, potentially. And I blogged on this this week, folks. Uh, this is the time to not only get caught up on CE, but uh, certainly you can get ahead a little bit if you wanted to, uh, because those hours will roll over into your next compliance cycle. So uh, the next few weeks shows, uh, certainly next week, um, we're going to have an HR uh, specialist on talking all about human resources and the issues that employers and employees are facing as they uh, work from home, work remotely uh, with COVID-19, but also have a lot of information from our guest, Dustin, about some of the stimulus stuff that has come out. And he'll be able to answer some of those questions uh, that we probably all have uh, because uh, the devil's in the details, right, Brian? The devil's always in the details with these things. Then the following week, our friend from uh, Vine IT will talk about some of the issues that we all face working remotely, whether it's from your own desktop or your own laptop, or, or you've now taken your desktop from your office and you're now working remotely and now you're connected through the network and what uh, issues you need to be aware of as you try to uh, secure and, uh, and safeguard that data. 
And then lastly, on the 24th, uh, uh, we'll have Frank Panaccio on talking about work comp issues. I told you earlier today that Frank posted a blog about some of this, uh, but working remotely from a work comp perspective um, is something uh, everybody needs to be aware of uh, when you're working at home and certainly have children around and dogs and pets around and so on and so forth. So uh, those are the upcoming shows. We look, uh, look forward uh, to you joining us in the next few weeks. Uh, thanks for attending today. Um, Becky was very active from South Carolina. So Becky, thank you so much uh, for, for tuning in today. And uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in today. Be safe out there. Let us know if we can help you in any way with anything. Certainly uh, contact FAI. A lot of information uh, continues to flow about COVID-19. Um, but uh, thanks for attending today. Be safe uh, and be healthy. Uh, have a great weekend, folks. And uh, get out today and get some fresh air. Have a great day.